So welcome everybody. I'm David Wilkins. I'm the director of the program in the legal profession. This is our weekly speaker series where we bring in really interesting people from the worlds of academics and practice to talk about recent developments of the legal profession. And today, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Michelle DiStefano. Michelle is a graduate of this fine institution in the class of 2002, where I think she had two classes with me, plus by being my research assistant, plus eventually becoming a research fellow in the program on the legal profession, but don't blame any of that on her. She's actually risen far above these uh, meager roots, and in fact now is a professor at uh, the University of Miami Law School, and is uh, really single-handedly, I say is no exaggeration, the inspiration behind what I think is the most interesting development in legal education today, and that's Law Without Walls. Um, which uh, maybe in the question and answer she'll talk a little bit about. But here she's going to talk about one of the most important topics facing lawyers and law firms today, and that's one of benchmarking. As law becomes more and more something to which people think ought to be held to standards, accountability for outcomes, how do we think about what benchmarking means uh, in areas where there's an overlap between law and, uh, and corporate compliance, which again is one of the most important things facing the legal profession today. So I'm positive you will have a terrific time listening to her, and uh, Michelle's going to talk for a while, but also is willing to take questions as we go along. Michelle. Great. Thanks, David. As all of you know, uh, it's a pleasure to take David's classes, and I would have taken every single class he ever taught. In fact, I'm going to follow him around the rest of the day and um, attend his classes with him today because he's such an inspirational person. So thanks for coming. I'm going to talk a little bit about compliance. Um, so corporations around the globe right now are facing a really, really huge challenge. Despite the current freeze on legal expenditure, corporations are having to invest heavily in compliance or what you might call managing the legal risk of business. Questions. There's so many questions about compliance. What is it? Where does legal end and compliance start? How is it managed? And who should be responsible for compliance in large corporations? Additionally, there's this whole um, literature and um, really movement around ethics and corporate culture. And how does compliance intersect with that? So in large publicly traded corporations, historically, the compliance department was led, run, and managed by the legal department. It was, even, you know, it was actually overseen by the chief legal officer. Um, in many respects, this is actually still true today. Many corporate practices and mandates put compliance in the hands of lawyers. So, for example, the ABA Task Force on Corporate Re Responsibility a few years ago recommended that general counsels oversee compliance with direct oversight to the board. Similarly, in a recent survey by the Association um, Corporate Counsel Association, survey respondents exclaimed that compliance was ultimately overseen by the general counsel, um, or the general counsel actually serves as the chief compliance officer. And as you all may know, Model Rule 1.13 and Sarbanes-Oxley uh, 307 puts the general counsel in that role of gatekeeper. But recently, we're seeing changes to this. Although the government, the Office of Inter uh, um, the OIG, the SEC, and the Department of he um, Health and Human Services doesn't require that compliance departments be separate from the legal departments, their unofficial stance is that the, these two mar par departments should be separate. Indeed, the SEC and the DHHS have forced corporations that have been in trouble recently to do just that, to develop these distinct compliance departments designate a chief compliance officer that does not report to anybody in the legal department and that has direct access to the board of directors. So consider the following four examples. So Sharing Plow. In 2004, Sharing Plow, one of the largest pharmaceutical corporations in the world, agreed to ple plead guilty to fraud in relation to uh, pricing um, that it gave to its HMOs for its drug Claritin. It paid over $293 million, and in its consent um, agreement or corporate integrity agreement, it agreed to establish a hotline, revise its corporate con um, code of contact and training, and specifically designate a chief compliance officer to report directly to the CEO. And in the corporate integrity agreement, it says, and not to the general counsel, with direct access to the board. 
Similarly, Quest Communications in 04, the SEC charged Quest with fraudulently projecting over $3.8 billion in revenue earnings. And so it agreed to pay $250 million, uh, $250 million and create a CCO position, much like we found in with Sharing Plow. Pfizer, 09, largest pharmaceutical manufacturer in the world, also got into trouble. Um, for illegally promoting some of its drugs uh, for uses that weren't approved by the FDA. So it pled guilty to a $2.3 billion felony criminal violation, signed a five-year corporate integrity agreement mandating, again, same things, hotline, heightened training, designating a CCO that would not be subordinate to the general counsel or be the general counsel and would have direct access to the board. So the next um, uh, group, individual um, corporation that got in trouble or entity is the SEC itself, which I find kind of ironic. In 10, 2010, the SEC was charged where there was a criminal investigation into possible insider trading. And when they went and dug into it, they realized that the SEC didn't even have a compliance department. And what they had as a compliance department was kind of, um, you know, kind of in lots of different areas. It was, uh, quote, not really existent. And to appease, the SEC created a real and singular compliance department with direct oversight by one designated chief compliance officer. So in sum, the reaction by the DDHS and the SEC has been what I sort of call a knee-jerk reaction to emphasize structure and management policies and programs around compliance, to demand that these um, corporations separate compliance from the legal department designate a CCO, not also the GC, to report to the um, board and have direct access to that board. And in some ways, this makes sense, right? It's consistent with recent laws and recommendations. SEC's compliance rule in 04 required each SEC registered investment company or advisor to designate a CCO and report directly to the board. And the federal sentencing guidelines um, a couple years ago were, were revised, and the way they defined what is a good compliance department was one that was separate and had a designated individual, and they give extra credit for those that have a separate CCO with direct reporting to the board. And guidelines by professional associations, the internal legal audit or um, OIG, all, everybody seems to be recommending these types of outward moves, and more and more corporations are following suit. So over the past few years, in the wake of these corporate scandals, in pharmaceutical, in insurance, financial services, it's running the gamut. We're seeing this trend, right? We're seeing this separation between the legal department and the compliance department. And it's really that these departments now are being led by what you might call non-lawyers or uh, non-practicing lawyers that report directly to the CEO and have this access. But the question is why? And should this be so? Why have organizations adopted this new stance on organizational structure of compliance? I mean, we know why the four examples I gave you did, because they were told to do it. But why are others following suit, and is this best practice? Lots and lots of questions. So does this mean that in-house lawyers, when they work in a legal department, somehow we impair ethics and compliance? Is that the message that we're getting? Or is it that when lawyers act as lawyers, they're less able to prevent or uncover and stop malfeasance. I mean, this seems you know, directly in conflict with why I went to law school, but um, who knows? And does taking compliance out of the hands of lawyers really create a type of change that we want at corporations, with this, which is a change in ethics and culture? So um, one wonders if this is just a formal solution, some formal solution that some, uh, that are now being, um, that's now being adopted by different corporations. So here's a quote from a general counsel. A number of early mover companies that created compliance departments did so as part of resolving a major mishap or high profile problem. So it was not a best practice. But after a number of major companies have done it over the years, it starts to look like a best practice. And once in that position, it becomes hard for a major corporation to explain why they don't have a compliance department. So we're all following the, the, people, the corporations that got into trouble. So I decided to go out and explore three questions. One, what is compliance? Because if you talk to um, a chief executive or an executive at any corporation, they all have a different definition of what is compliance. How is it managed and where is it currently housed in large publicly corporations? And lastly, who should oversee it? What are the risks and benefits of a distinct compliance function run by X lawyers or non-practicing lawyers that report to the um, CEO and board? Those were my three questions. 
And so I conducted qualitative interviews in two stages. The first stage was actually um, coincided with a project that I was working on with David Wilkins, Ashish Nanda, and John Coates to try to determine how large corporations purchase legal services. Um, I spoke to general counsels for 90 minutes and stole eight minutes to talk to them about compliance. This was in 2007 before the meltdown and there were about 40 interviews along that subject um, during that stage. Stage two has been happening for the last two years where I've been conducting more in-depth interviews with chief compliance officers and general counsels. So I'll talk to both at the corporation or one if they're one and the same. And I've also talked to lower level compliance officers. I've, been, I've done it across six industries, pharma, energy, healthcare, consumer products, financial services, and miscellaneous, which is a couple of marketing and advertising agencies. And um, I had a few goals coming into it. So I wanted to conduct at least 30 to 40 with two to three companies per industry. I've done that, conducted 35 to date. One ex-general counsel in each industry, I have two left to go. Um, I've always found that the ex-general counsels or the few that I've talked to have a really, really interesting things to say about their former jobs um, as opposed to the general counsels that are in the company. Some lower level compliance managers, right? So what the general counsel or chief compliance officer considers important and what is compliance and what is the culture, very different than what a lower level employee might tell you. A couple non-public companies to just kind of gauge that and one senior manager, I've talked to a couple people that used to, two different people, one that used to work at the SEC and one that used to work at the OIG. Um, and one to two compliance consultants. None of what I'm going to tell you here today is statistically significant. Absolutely all of it is descriptive and anecdotal, and I don't, we don't need any of it really to make some of the claims that we might make to, together here about compliance. But as a, an academic, kind of learning from David Wilkins, I always like to check in with the people that are actually doing, doing what I'm writing about. Because sitting in my office teaching students, I can't keep up with what's happening out in the real world. So I try really hard to talk with people, interview them, so that I can have some type of real world impact um, with my research. So my findings to date, again, um, not statistical, are that the general counsels um, in the first part, stage one, are really overseeing compliance and actually still leading it. After the meltdown, we're seeing a slight change in that um, compliance is still part of the legal department, so we'll ultimately roll up to the general counsel, but the general counsel is not the chief compliance officer. And in those situations where they're distinct, it was most often that it was the former associate general counsel that was been, has been designated to move over and head the compliance department. Recent example, Kraft just separated into two companies, Mondelez and Kraft. The former associate general counsel is now the chief compliance officer of Mondelez. I just met with their whole compliance team last week. And um, it's just fascinating to see companies wa actually working through these issues right now. Okay, so um, biggest finding, which you probably know, which, but I think is really, really important, is compliance departments are made up of a lot of lawyers. It's almost like having two legal departments. And that there's this really blurry distinction between what is law and what is compliance, as blurry as between love and hate, trust me. Um, so, and the problem often faced by the chief compliance officer is the giving of legal advice. I mean, it's really hard not to be giving legal advice when for years you've been giving legal advice to your corporation and the nature of the scope of the job. So, um, there's some consensus in the interviews around what's similar between the two departments. Legal and com compliance departments both rely on legal expertise and have a shared goal to increase compliance. There's some consensus in distinctions. People, both general counsels and chief compliances alike will say the chief compliance officer focuses on building policies and procedures, monitoring compliance and adherence to those procedures, training, educating employees about their obligations, testing employees on their adherence. But then we get to the claimed distinctions and these start to make you wonder a little bit about, you always when you do qualitative interviews have to accept who's talking and what motivations they might have for saying what they're saying. So what I heard from compliance officers was that compliance officers um, care about preventing misconduct, um, neutral fact finding, acting in the interest of stakeholders and in uncovering misconduct, ethics, and culture. That's what compliance officers care about. Um, compliance officers have different reporting obligations. They're not acting as lawyers, supposedly, um, and they can't garner the attorney-client privilege, supposedly. And Compliance requires management know-how. We talk a lot, I'm sure you've heard about project management skills. People keep saying lawyers don't have that. Well, wonders how, this, how does this work when the compliance department is made suddenly of all lawyers, but now the chief compliance officer has all these skills. Um, HR matters, communications, auditing, and internal controls, while legal work 
requires training in the law. Lawyers tell you what the law says. I can't tell you there wasn't, I don't think there was a chief compliance officer out there that didn't make this distinction. Lawyers are considered with legal liability and defending the corporation at all costs. Lawyers tell you whether you can do something. Compliance tells you whether you should. Now in my interviews with general counsels, they think they're telling corporations what they should do, but suddenly when they become compliance officers, there's a, there's a de demarcation there. Typical quote. The general counsel's job is to advise the company and senior managers of the legal risks, but not even initiate the conversation over what is the right thing to do. The general counsel's job is more black and white. So these distinctions appear to be a bit artificial. So if you have a broad view, as I do, as I think people like Ben Heinemann do, although I can't speak for him, only based on what I've read, um, that general counsel should have or do have some gatekeeping responsibilities and that they should play the role of counselor in charge of the corporate culture and ethics and the corporate conscious, then these distinctions really are artificial. Because many general counsel interviews saw these distinctions in reverse. They claim that the general counsel, as opposed to the chief compliance officer, is in charge of ethics and the culture of the corporation. And that the CCOs can sometimes be seen just as traffic cops. So perhaps it is the philosophy of the role that matters more than the titles. So I went out and I decided, well, why don't, why don't I attempt to identify a typology of the roles that chief compliance or officers play? Now granted, my sample size is really small, and many of them will use different um, attitudes in different situations. But I did see a theme throughout, and you could bucket some of these um, compliance officers into certain roles. Um, Okay, so the first one, the automaton. These chief compliance officers focus on building policies and procedures and monitoring adherence. They conduct training, they educate their employees on specific regulations. They often aren't lawyers. So these are the few chief compliance officers that, are, that weren't lawyers, but they believe they can read and interpret the law. Law is out there, we can read it, we can interpret it, we don't need your lawyers to do anything, and we're just going to make sure that we comply with it. The investigator, think Mark Wahlberg and The Departed, right? He says, I'm the guy who does his job, you must be the other guy. They're out there to go uncover bad stuff, okay? Then there's the spy. You gotta think James Bond, this is a little different. The, the couple spies or spy attitudes that I found were when the corporation actually had a corporate monitor, corporate compliance monitor afoot. So after you get in trouble, it, the government often makes you um, hire an outsider corporate compliance monitor that kind of shadows you. So think of it a little bit like when you were in elementary school and the teacher says, who's going to be the monitor while I go to the bathroom? Okay, so it's sort of like that. And the chief compliance officer feels an obligation to, to both, and but really funnels the information over to the compliance monitor. The counselor. This is more like Cron Cronman's lawyer statesman. Right? So these guys are acting as lawyers, they have a really broad view of their role, they believe they should be counseling the corporation on what is the right thing to do, but they understand that sometimes their advice may not be followed. They don't expect that the advice is followed, um, but they, they may expect to be able to say, I told you so. So one um, great general counsel that, that I've um, gotten to know outside of the interviews as well has said, I like to play the business card game with my CEO. Whenever there's a tough conversation around ethics and compliance in the law, I ask my CEO to take out his business card. I take out mine. I point out as we look at the business cards that his says, President, CEO, and Chairman. And my card says, VP, General Counsel, General Counsel, and Counsel. I explain that I want to concentrate on the counsel part. My card gives me the right to counsel you, and you can disregard it, but I get to say I told you so. So, um, the other uh, uh, role is the involved parent. So this is the ex-lawyer. This is the ex-general counsel, associate general counsel, that now has become the chief compliance officer. And it's a little different than that counselor role, right? It's like your parent sitting down with you and counseling you, doing almost the same thing as I just talked about in the former slide, except you know they can, they can, make you, um, uh, they can give you a curfew if they want. You know that they can actually pull your funding for college if you want. So they, these people, when they play this role, will let you think that they're counseling you, but at the end of the day, they feel like they have the right to um, draw the bottom line. Then there's the business bottom liners, and these are a couple of compliance departments actually report right up to ERM, right? Emergency risk management, um, the, in different departments like operation, enterprise risk management, and operations and they really see compliance as a cost center and risk to be managed. It's all about the bottom line. 
And then there's the, what I call the scarecrow. And the scarecrow is, is when there's no one person in charge. And um, so there's really no direction and it's unclear who's going to be overseeing compliance. And those companies do this because they say, we don't offer someone as a compliance officer because if we did that, then everyone would think it was just the compliance officer's business and no one had to do compliance. One wonders if just no one's doing compliance then if there isn't any designation. Okay, so there's so many different archetypes, so many different roles that a chief compliance officer can play. So maybe the right question is, what are the risks and benefits of having the two segregated departments? Does segregation in and of itself create specific ne negative repercussions or positive consequences? And there's lots of um, risks and um, segregations out there in the literature that's not new. So they say, if we combine the two departments, we have a conflict of interest. The lawyer, let's say somebody gets in trouble, the lawyer might want to do a secret deal, make it go away, try not to get legal liability. The chief compliance officer might want to make an example of that person, you know, put pictures up, want it. Uh, for bad behavior. So there might be a conflict of interest there. Also, you keep hearing about if the two departments are together, there's a huge zone of secrecy because the legal department can, under the attorney-client privilege, hide everything and therefore we can't find out and uncover malfeasance. Then you hear about the risk that if they're separate. There's turf wars, right? No, that's mine to do. No, that's yours to do. I'm applying legal advice. No, you're not supposed to apply legal advice. Um, and inefficiencies, lots of inefficiencies around communication, around shared learnings. All studies show that when people sit closer to each other, when people are in the same department, there's more shared learnings. Some of that goes away. But here are some of the interesting findings that I found that I haven't read out there in the literature. So this idea that there might be the revival of the legal technician. So separating the functions could actually make true the fallacy that lawyers tell you what you can do and chief compliance officers tell you what you should. Maybe it decreases the need for lawyers to play that role of gatekeeper and to consider ethics and morals and returns us to a time 20 years ago when the legal department was again just seen as the place where the, you heard the word no. Um, or maybe that's what will happen with the compliance department. Maybe the compliance department will be where you hear the word no. So as we enter Richard Susskind's you know, 2.0 world, and compliance gets more and more automated, um, we may end up uh, where we have CCOs that are terminators, where is that slide, right? Where they all they consider is, I'm gonna get you, this is what matters, comply with the law, and we're not actually considering morals and ethics and whatnot. <laughs> and then with respect to the attorney-client privilege, it's not clear that more information will actually be protected if the departments are together, ironically, I think more information will be protected if they're apart. And here's why. If they're together, immediately when, they, when the, the corporation tries to get attorney-client privilege protection, the argument can be made that the lawyer was wearing two hats, providing business and legal advice. As you know, you can only get the protection if you primarily went to the lawyer for legal advice. Gets really, really fuzzy and often that's how you lose attorney-client privilege. When they're separate, it's simple. Compliance department, working on their own, doesn't get attorney-client privilege. Whenever there's a lawyer in the room, clearly they needed legal advice, and so you can make a much better argument that the lawyer, when they're working with the compliance officer, is actually there to serve legal advice, and so I argue that it's turning it on its head, and what the government wants to do, which is open up this shield, they're actually creating a larger shield if we separate the two departments up the way that they suggest. And then there's the risk of the unauthorized practice of law. I mean. Are lawyers ever not lawyers? There's no such thing as a non-practicing lawyer, one of my general counsel said. If you're a lawyer, you're a lawyer. And it doesn't matter if you're licensed to practice law or not. People look at you as a lawyer and rely on you to dispense that legal advice. And therefore, I'm a GC of a company. If one of my lawyers screws up, I'm responsible. I can't say, well, that's one of my lawyers in compliance. I can't say that I'm just not a lawyer anymore suddenly. So that's one of the risks. And then another risk is now we have all these lawyers who are no longer lawyers who are working in a department, which means they no longer have to follow the model rules of professional conduct. We have enough trouble, trouble getting lawyers who are lawyers to follow the model rules of professional conduct, let, ago, let alone lawyers that are now being told they no longer are lawyers. There's a whole, Tina Rothstein has written a whole article about the rise of law consulting by ex-lawyers. So another risk is that now, compliance is just another risk to be managed, right? It's just another part of our bottom line. 
There's also a risk of strict liability. We're seeing that more and more. Compliance officers just accepting um, liability when something goes wrong. Not sure if that's really the right move for this industry, but it's something that has come up. And then, of course, it's not clear that um, these changes are changes that are happening because of the demands of the work. <coughs> Leaders, leading researchers on organizational theory sometimes say that organizational structure actually develops about a myth, right, around a myth. Is that what's happening here? Are these just copycat um, uh, institutions, copycat structures where we're having compliance and compliance be separate, but really it's not at the end of the day doing what it's supposed to be doing. So then I back up and say, well, the only way we're going to determine who should be overseeing compliance and whether it should be seg segregated is to agree on the objectives. So are the objectives to increase the corporation's compliance with the rule of law or just its normative commitment to it or to maybe enhance the expectations of society that society has and should have of lawyers and their role of gatekeepers? So not sure that the current mandate actually talks to any of those goals. The current trend or mandate really applauds form over function. Although it's true that the SE claims it's going to assess whether a corporation has a culture of compliance, it doesn't appear to be that they're actually analyzing those things, right? They're not even considering the importance of collaboration to effective compliance and culture. They're not doing a social networking analysis, which can be done on corporations to see if there's bottlenecks in communication. Instead, they're prizing independence and traditional notions of control over this idea of interdependency, embeddedness that David Wilkins talks a lot about, and collaboration. And they're emphasizing these outward formal exemplifications. So these are proxies for compliance, the org chart, the code of conduct, the training manuals and programs. Look how look what did this, this group. Um, so in order to find the critical gaps, I think the focus should be more on the internal aspects of the organization, so how people interact. Studies show that the way people interact is really informal, and the cultural and communication norms actually don't follow the org charts. They just don't. And it's the hidden networks. It's those hidden social communications that impact the choices that employees make, not the public formal ethics program, not the code of conduct, and not the mission statements. It's not even necessarily the tone at the top. As someone, one of my general counsels points out, I care about the tone. She says, I care about the tone at the middle. I care about what that, that plant manager is saying and doing um, that's as opposed to what the CEO is saying. So researchers agree that formal systems are the weakest link in the organization's ethical infrastructure and are far eclipsed by what's happening in a more informal way. So we need to focus on how people are motivated, carrots or sticks, right? So I'm sure you've all read some of the literature on that. Um, that you know, compliance functions, when they're root or check the box, which of course there's a bunch of them, are really easy to uncover and really easy to motivate. To a certain degree, you can give money to somebody and that will work to a certain, to a certain point. But it doesn't always continue to, point, to, to work. In fact, at daycares, um, there are studies that show that as soon as you tell moms and dads that for every five minutes they'll be fined $10, Lateness goes up hugely because suddenly it's no longer an ethical choice. Suddenly they don't owe anybody anything. It's just a matter. It's a cost. It's a cost. Uh, it's a cost risk association. Well, if I don't go, I have to pay ten dollars. Right now, I'd rather pay ten dollars and be be ten minutes late so I can finish this email. Um, so when the choice revolves um, around non-routine tasks and it, it requires an employee to make some type of moral or ethical choice or even personal preference, it's so much harder to control the behavior on carrots or sticks. So. Monetary incentives can take the good out of doing good, like the daycare example, and if then, doesn't always work. Because people are motivated by two different things. They have external motivations and they have internal motivations. So in order to find the, the qualitative, the critical gaps, we need to look at how people make ethical decisions. How does ethics and compliance together go together? And right now, compliance isn't really considering that what happens is employees don't necessarily, and managers, don't necessarily recognize an ethical decision as an ethical decision. So there's, what can happen is blind spots. I mean, think the Pinto. I know I'm dating myself, but back in the early 70s, the Pinto had these exploding um, engines, and I'm sure I've, gas tanks. Gas tanks. 
Chester. And were they in the front or the back? back. They were right. They were behind the bumper. That was the problem. Right. So <laughs> and they, they were behind the axle. And evidently they knew before they put it out, and they did a cost benefit analysis that it would be easier, and they'd make more money by actually uh, continuing with the production of the Pinchos and dealing with the lawsuits that, that would arise instead of pulling them off the market. Or the Challenger. Evidently, everybody knew what was going to happen. But they called it a management decision, a business decision. And so by reframing it, it was no longer considered an ethical decision. So there's this desensitization that can happen at a corporation. Um, and ethical fading also can happen with your kids and computer games. And so my preliminary conclusions about the trend is that large publicly traded corporations shouldn't just preemptively comply and start creating these big compliance departments and separating them out and making them have direct reporting to the board. And instead um, of focusing on these outward structures, they should start looking inward, right? They should start doing these social networking analyses as opposed to org chart analyses on how the um, communication chains are structured at their company. And that the, if the government's going to go get bonus points, let's get bonus points for companies that are doing those types of things, that are actually showing that they're trying to do some internal change. If that it results in external change, great. But unless we shouldn't be giving points just for the external change. So it leaves us with these questions still. And um, I have three articles coming out of this project. And I'm working through the answers to those questions, all of these questions. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to end, because uh, I still have some more research to do, but I'd love to hear from any of you if you have any questions or any thoughts about, you know, it, are lawyers better able than non-lawyers? I've had lots of great discussions about that with general counsels, <coughs> about the culture of the company, how do you create the culture of the company, and whether or not compliance should be separate. So with that, I close off, and I've talked enough, and I'd love to hear from any of you. <laughs>